Oakland's own. Y'all give Mr. Fab the biggest round of applause for the day, please. I remember playing high school basketball up in here. This was the spot, man. We did a party here a couple months ago, but then bringing it back here to this, this was like, if you got a chance to play at the Henry J. Kaiser, you might, you was one of them people. <laughs> Happy to be here today. Um, first of all, my name is Stanley Cox, AKA Mr. Fab. I represent Oakland, California. Um, happy and honored to be here today. A friend of mine, I was telling him what we were doing and he instantly said, you speaking at a mushroom convention? What you want? <laughs> and I told him, I said, man, uh, you'd be amazed at the connections of worlds. Um, let's say if we were able to travel in the nebula, you would see so many different likeness and you would see things that connect. It's, um, it's rare that a person gets a chance to understand how much alike many of us are because we stay in our own wood, we stay in our own world. Some of us are so locked into our own world that we really don't understand. Our neighbors are almost just as like us. This is so much. Until I was able to start traveling the world, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize that uh, what we like to say is uh, the world is a ghetto. And what I mean by that is the things that we do in our neighborhood, me and my, uh, me and my uncle got a chance to go, to go to Africa last year. And we were, um, we were in Cape Town and we were in some of, some of like, uh, we just went into the neighborhood. He, me, I go and I'm a complete tourist on the road. I do the tourist American stuff. I go to the resort, I chill, I don't wanna come out. I'm he like, man, let's go see the city, what for? I live in Oakland, I don't need to see any poverty, I don't need to see any of that, I see that enough. And he was like, no, let's just go explore, let's go see what it's like in their world. And, as, and upon our voyage and our adventure, a little boy came up to us, he was like, hey man, trying to raise some money for my soccer team. And I was like, I was like, I used to use that line outside of Safeway. He had the whole paper, can you sign this? Like, like I'm like, I'm like, man, we used to lie like this. Like, we raised the money for a baseball team. None of us played baseball. And so I'm just sitting there, we walking around, and you see certain things, you're like, he did what? We understood that even though it was a different area, different country, different world, it was the same hustle. It was the same grind. It was the same things. And when we're dealing with the connection with spirituality and ascending to these higher levels of, of, of healing, we understand that regardless of a person's method of how they heal, the main thing is we're on a road of healing. We are trying to heal and we're trying to be the best versions of ourselves. In becoming the best versions of ourselves, there has to be sacrifices made. There has to be an understanding of the worlds that we come from and the things of what are we gonna do different because nothing changes if nothing changes. We can all agree upon that. Understanding that for us to take a step to the next level of our ascension, whether that be healing or whatever it is. Timothy Leary had some things going on in the 50s and the, sec in the, in the 60s, the 70s, when he began to uh, explore in with the psilocybin and, and, and how he was able to extract these things and what it was in the mushrooms that brought about healing, about the reactors in the brain and the things that would allow a person through psychedelics to open up certain levels in their brain. Where we from in other areas, we call it, man, the opening of our chakras. We call it the tapping into our pioneer glands. We ask, and there's different words for a lot of this. A lot of our ancestors would use Fargate fungus. And then this things, they would, this was healing. We saw it in the Aztecs, we saw it in the Incas, and we saw it in early traces in, 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 in Egypt. We were in Egypt, as I was saying, uh, as we went to Africa, we went to other countries, we did Egypt, and we were inside the pyramids. And inside the pyramids, they would have Im images of like magic mushrooms where, and I'm looking, I'm like, I'm like, they was using mushrooms back then? I'm watching it and I'm looking and, and, and the guy, the translator is, is breaking down some of the hieroglyphs and I was just blown away by how a lot of this stuff has been around for so long. A lot of things have been around, like they say, there's nothing new under the sun. Some things have just been disguised, some things have been hidden, and some things have popped back in other forms. The reincarnation of certain information, how it has come back to us in different forms and shapes of life, and it's like, wow. 
Every other Wednesday, I do this seminar and a workshop called Thug Therapy. The Thug stands for Teaching, Healing, Uniting, and Guiding. And it's a men's group that we do every Wednesday, and we have a woman's group called Tea Time, Teaching, Empowering, and Advancing. So in this group and in these groups, my main thing is saying, when, we, when you hear therapy, where we come from in our neighborhoods, when you hear therapy, the first person say, man, I ain't finna be in there talking to them white people. And I'll be like, bro, wait a minute, bro, it ain't that kind of therapy, what you mean? Nah, bro, therapy, blood, they come in, they just wanna ask you all kind of questions, they make you seem like you crazy, bro. My, my mama used to try to have me go talk to counselors when I was in school, I didn't do it then, I ain't doing it now. The biggest, confusion that we deal with is that it's that. There's a stigma out there that black men don't go to therapy. And in that, they refuse to do it because they look at it as like it's some antichrist, like, nah, man, I ain't going to therapy. Therapy? Therapy and a doctor, it's hard to get a black man to go to. So when people have been hearing that we have these weekly events and not only black men, Latino men, Caucasian men, men from all walks of life are in there, 150, 200 men every other Wednesday, sitting down, actually healing, therapeutic. Last week, a question that I asked some of the members was, when is the last time you've cried that wasn't death related? And some of the brothers was in there like, what you mean? Like, when the last time have you cried? Like, just a simple tears coming out your eyes. And some of the people inside said, I don't remember. And I said, when the last time you had an oil change in your car? It's like, oh man, I was at Jiffy Lube the other day, woo woo. Follow me of what I'm saying. I say now, if you don't change that oil and that oil light comes up, your car start running bad, right? If we don't change and drench and wet and water our spiritual side inside of our bodies, then our body will start running hot. And a lot of us have been running hot. A lot of us hasn't had a chance, haven't had a chance to actually interrogate ourselves, investigate ourselves. I'll ask that same question. When is the last time some of you have cried? You? Can't remember? That's okay. When the last time you cried? That wasn't death related. A year ago? You? It's a question that seems so simple, but when you actually ask it, like, damn, when is the last time that I've cried? Me, I'm a crybaby, sorry. I might cry today. I cry often. Reason being is because I watched what not crying does to you. I had a grandfather that was very militant, very militant. Everything had something. he wake up in the morning, about face. Six in the morning, dog. What we, what we on, dog? What we doing here? Like he'd make you line up for breakfast. You got to march for breakfast. Talk. Everything was military based with him. You ask him what time it is, 1706. Like, hey, come on, dog. Couldn't just say five o'clock, man. Like, what are we doing? So he was very militant. But inside, he was so layered. Those one-on-ones with granddaddy, when you go fishing with him and you realize how layered he had to be and you realize that he never had a chance or a space to have a safe space to be the person who he truly is. So he had to be this sergeant. He had to be militant. He had to be referred to as the grumpy old man because he was actually layered, he was hurt. A lot of our parents were forced into adulthood prematurely. A lot of us were. A lot of us jumped into adulthood prematurely. My mother had me at a very young age. Before my mother died, I had to forgive my mom. 
I had to forgive my mom because I didn't understand what she was going through as a black woman fighting the world at 13 by herself. Then having a son trying to protect him from the same world that she's fighting. Then drugs. Then manipulative men such as my father. Abusive men such as her father. She had to layer herself to be this superwoman. So as she began unraveling these layers towards the inner times of her life, I sat back and I had to sit down and was like, damn, mom, you held that in this whole time? This is what you were up against? Many of us are up against a lot of things that we don't have a safe space to vent it. Some of us in here right now are fighting some silent wars that we've never told anything, anyone about. Some of us have done some things that we're going to take to the grave with us. When we begin to talk about at what moment did we feel like we needed to heal? At what moment did you feel like I need to find some type of spiritual rejuvenation because I'm at the lowest point that I've been? I watched my uncle fight a drug addiction for 20 some years. Then I watched him get healthy and the conflict of saying every time life got hard, it was easy to go run back to the drugs. It was easy to go run back to the lowest version of ourselves. Sometimes we have to understand that, hey, when I have this outer body experience, I have to look at myself. And as I look at myself, I have to say, is this the version that you want to die as? I'll ask you, what version of you do you want to die as? And when you figure out that answer, then you begin to start living like that. You begin to start living as that version. I'm not the perfect person. I don't try to be. I, like, I actually like my mess ups. I like my imperfectness. I like my mistakes. I love all of that about me. I love that I wear my heart on my sleeve. I love that my my selfishness comes in a form of selflessness. We do charity events, we do in, in events and people be like, bro, why do you do this? That's my selfish. The hero and the villain are the same person. Will we all agree? If you don't, I wanna break it down why I say this. Something has happened to the hero. In his mind, in her mind, she says, I'm never going to allow anybody else to go through what I've gone through. They dedicate the rest of their life to protecting those that have been unprotected. That's heroic. They dedicate their lives to giving to those that have been given nothing. Something happens to the villain. The villain says, I'm going to make everybody feel my pain. I'm about to make everybody in this world feel what I've gone through. And I'm not sparing nobody. This whole world is going to feel my wrath. But in reality, they're both the same person. It's just how they responded to what happened to them. We've learned that 90% in this life, 90% of things in this life is about how do you respond to it? How do you respond to the 10% of things that have happened to you? And there as you'll begin to see the path that you begin to trot down. And jaunting down this path, we discover a lot about ourselves. At 42 years old, I just realized that I still have dad issues. I have father issues because my dad would say, I'm on my way. And I would sit on the steps and I would wait. And my mom would say things like, get your stupid ass off the stairs, he's not coming. 
And I just thought that she was still mad at him because of the stuff that they went through. And she had given up on him. And she wanted me to give up on him the way that she had gave up on him. Not knowing that she was protecting me because she knew he hadn't accepted that change in his life yet to grow into fatherhood. So I would sit on that steps. I got my glove in one hand. I got the ball in the other hand. And I'm just playing catch with myself. And I'm watching the sun leave footprints in the sky. And as it goes down, I walk in the house. She'll cook me something. She'll say, come here, come give me a hug. Because she knew that. <laughs> here are those tears. Um, <laughs> she knew how much I loved my father. And she would give me a hug and she would say, it's not your fault. Because the first thing that we thought is, why you don't love me? Why won't he come play catch with me? So, some of the things that you go through, you deal with it. You start realizing that those trust issues come out when somebody say, hey, bro, I'm on my way. And you don't get dressed till they get there. They like, bro, I told you 30 minutes ago I was on my way. Well, my daddy told me 30 years ago that he was on his way and he never came. And you joke about it, but the reality of it is you're affected by it. And you don't realize it until you begin to accept it. These therapy things that we've been doing, I, I, I started organizing these groups just for people that I knew that here it is, me, this rapper, this local celebrity who may have accomplished certain things, da 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 da, da. If I'm going through these things, imagine the person that may not have access to some of the things that I have access to. Imagine what they going through. So as I stood on the precipice of trying to say, do I still want to keep denying it? Or do I want to open the floodgates to not only help myself, but be the voice for many people that have been muzzled? Do I speak about this and allow this to be an open discussion of things that I've hidden, the lies that I've told myself, the nights of getting high, trying to hide it, thinking that if I get so loaded tonight when I wake up in the morning, my reality will be different. The nights of sipping syrup till you pass out and smoking blunt after blunt after blunt after blunt after blunt, thinking that you're going to forget about it. But the reality is you're just wrapping things around it. Unfortunately, as men that come from the areas that we come from, we don't have a safe space. We can't talk to our woman about it because as soon as she get mad, she throw it back in our face. So we shut down in there. Soon as she, so the moment she get mad, the moment you do something to piss her off, it's oh, your daddily, daddily ass, you make up some words, daddily ass. You're like, daddily lists. That's why you don't know your daddy. Who your daddy? Damn, you don't throw this in my face. I've confided, tried to confide in you some things that. So we shut down with the people, that, the person that we're with. It's so sad that people give feelings a gender. That when we talk to our friends about it, they like, oh man, you on some girl shit. Pardon my language. But they've given feelings gender. And I'm here to tell you that feelings don't have gender, y'all. Feelings don't have gender. And tough love wasn't enough love. We grew up having to hold things in. 
you fall, get up. You bet not cry. We were more afraid of getting a whooping for crying than actually crying. Like, bro, I am hurt, bro. This is broke. <laughs> this is, I broke my wrist, cuz my arm, shoulder is this. I'm, this is broken. Don't cry. What do you mean? You bet not cry. Wow, this is crazy. I can't go to the doctor either. I'm sitting over here with a broke arm and I can't cry about this because that's girly. So imagine growing up in these areas where you've had to be tough. Everything is tough. Tough this, tough love, tough this, tough. You gotta be, where we from, you gotta be gangster. Not knowing that gangster turns you into robber. Gangster turns you into thief. Gangster turns you into drug dealer. Gangster turns you into shooter. Gangster turns you into killer. Gangster turns you into rapist. All of these things because you had to be tough. I would tell my mom, mom, I want to be an astronaut. You better astronaut your ass in that room. Hard as I'm working all day, you talking about you want to be an astronaut. Put you on the moon if you don't clean that damn room. You'll be an astronaut, all right. You shut down. I can't even come to my mama and tell her about what I want to do. Now I'm not dreaming no more. I don't even care about dreams no more. It ain't going to, my own mama shut me down. I don't even want to dream no more. Now you have a lot of kids out here that come up in our ears who are afraid to dream. And like they say, what's life without a dream? What's life with a, for a kid who feel like he can't even relate to anything that somebody else is talking to because they've never had a safe space to dream? We didn't have a safe space to be kids. 14, 15 years old, our mom got to talk about, so uh, you know this rent, do. I need something on that. Huh? At 15, I got to start paying rent? You better go to that corner and go tell one of your little friends, give you some of that stuff that they selling out there. Your own parents force you into the drug game, force you into certain things. Now you didn't forfeit your childhood. Then you stop playing sports because your parents too busy or don't want to come support you. You go to the game, you look in the crowd, everybody else's parents there, your mama not there. You I don't even want to play no more. Mom, when you gonna come to one of our games? You know I got to work, stop asking me about them stupid ass games. Man, I just want you to see me play, mom. I've never played catch with my father. Dad never came to one of my games. A lot of my friends stopped playing sports because their parents never supported them. I'm talking about I have friends that was at professional level. Man, why you ain't playing basketball no more? Ah, oh, man, got to get this money. Not knowing that it trickles down to I had to help my mama with rent. My grandmama had eight kids at the house. I got tired of going to school and I didn't have the latest clothes on. You wonder how all of this stuff connects. Because I want you guys to dive into the mental dichotomy of somebody that grows from the areas that we grow from and why certain trajectories in their life are prevented and prohibited because of the fact of what they were dealing with. When we start talking about how can we heal where do, we, where do we grow? Where do we build? Where do we feel as if, where's our connectivity with something better? We dive into the spiritual pool. In the spiritual pool, we feel free. Some of the best times of my life and worst times of my life of me feeling free is when I just said, man, I'm just going to get high. I don't care. At least I know at this high moment in my life, I'm escaping this harsh reality that I'm dealing with. My mother died, my father died, my grandmother died. My brother has been in jail for the past 27 years. Pretty tough life, but we've normalized abnormal behavior. So when you say that life to somebody who does it understand they don't grasp that concept they just like damn man you had a pretty rough life how are you who you are 
Uh, it was just normal. All my partners' mamas did, or dauphines, or all my friends been in jail their whole life. You, you walk around like it's nothing. And then you start realizing, wait a minute, I might be, something might be wrong with me. I might be going through, if I've normalized this, like we come from a community right now where somebody can start shooting outside and people will be like, oh, what's going on? We'd be like, oh, them for, we trying to name the gun. Like, oh, that's a 4-5, that's a 4-5. Now, hold on. Now, that's a nine, bro. That's a nine. You shoot. I can hear it. You'd be like, what? You're not worried about where the bullet's going. You're not worried about know who getting shot. You're worried about what kind of gun it is because you've normalized these things. And we laugh at it. Certain things that we laugh at is just that's our reality. That's our reality. And the hardships that we go with and we deal with and how we normalize. I woke up this morning, checked Instagram. One of my friends was murdered last night. I called his cousin like, bro, what happened to Reem? He like, oh, man, he got stabbed on 15th uh, last night. I was like, damn, that's crazy. The next thing I said, not even just processing it, was, but could you believe Duke beat Houston last night? He like, bro, I messed off my whole bracket. We jumped into a whole sports conversation. I had to call him back and say, bro, I apologize. I apologize because I was being inconsiderate to what you might be going through right now, bro. But, because I'm learning how to do that now. I'm learning how to be conscious of, of someone else's feelings. Things that I may have normalized, I have to learn to realize that some people haven't got to that level of perspective yet. When you get to a level of peace in your life, you know the importance of that journey. You don't compromise not only yours, but anybody else's peace. If, something, if someone is doing something that they enjoy, that they love to do, you applaud them. You stand in solidarity with them and you say, man, I am going to accompany you on your journey because if you are at a peaceful place in life, I'm, I'm clapping for you because I understand how hard it was for you to get there. My daughter's mom is in Africa right now. She called me a couple nights ago and she said, I want to stay a little, like maybe another couple extra days. Is that okay with you? I'm like, yeah. She's like, I just don't want you to be, you know, upset that I'm out here. And when I say, baby girl, listen, dealing with me is enough. I know I didn't stress you out beyond your years. I know it. If you are happy where you are in your life right now, I'm happy for you. I'm so, I'm so happy for you. I told her, I said, I was truly happy for you because for the first time in our lives, I'm happy for you without having to be happy, responsible for your happiness. I said, this is how happy I am for you, that I'm so happy for you because I don't have to be responsible for your happiness. So I'm really truly happy for you because I don't have any attachments to your happiness. I'm just happy to see you happy. When you get to that perspective of peace, life becomes so much better. And I am here to tell you that no matter what you do to get to that level, if you get to that level, enjoy it. And don't let nobody force you to compromise what peace is to you. Because we fought so hard to get to a peaceful place. So if it's ketamine, if it's psilocybin, if it's whatever it is, if it's magic mushrooms, if it's weed, if it's what, whatever it is. I asked a person, a brother came to me, one of the Israelites brothers. He was like, brother, do you know where we from? And I just looked at him and was like, brother, you happy? Before you get to telling me about uh, Israel and Abraham and all, uh, all Canaan and all these, you happy? He said, yeah, man, I'm at peace. God bless you. Because you're not going to talk my ear off for 45 minutes about some information you just learned that you're just happy to share. Brother, the Edomites is, woo, woo, brother, listen. You happy? Yeah, I'm happy. Peace, brother. 
I'm not finna sit up here and get to talking to you about our religious differences. I'm not finna get up here talking about our cultural differences. I don't wanna get up here and talk about the things that you have to, I wanna tell you, I wanna, when I'm dealing with people and I say something, brother, are you happy? Sister, are you happy? Are you at peace? And if you are, come on. We are a part of a peaceful tribe. Our tribe represents peace and love. And we trying to get everybody to get to that same feeling. Because one thing you have to understand is there are individuals that are at war with themselves. They are so much at war with themselves that they are looking for any punching bag that they can release anger out on because they get tired of punching themselves. They get tired of pinching themselves. They get tired of blowing up on themselves and now they're looking for anybody. You ever just seen somebody mad for no reason? Like, bro, you just mad? You wake up mad? Just every day you just pissed off. You don't know what I'm going through, what I've been through. Okay, you're right, I'm sorry. All you can do is hope that they find a peaceful place. Some people are angry because no one has ever been emotionally available to them. And then that's when we be learning to stop being naive to why they're angry. And we sit back and we sit and don't try to stress yourself out trying to study why they're angry. Because they may not be ready to reveal why they're angry. I have a saying saying we have to reveal to heal. That means that you have to get to a level of comfortability with talking about some of the things that have hurt you. Some people are not ready for that. I got a chance to experience success early. What I mean by success, where we equate success at, we equate it by how much money you got. You got a nice car, you're driving around, Mercedes, you got whatever, won't, won't, okay, that's successful. To me, at this age, that's not success anymore. Success is peace now. Success is I don't have a dollar in my pocket, but I am happy. I am chilling. I'm not worried about nothing. I'm thankful. I'm spreading love. I'm sitting up saying I'm, I'm being responsive. I'm calling back. I'm, I'm sharing. I'm hugs. I'm smiling. Hey, to me, that's success. Now, when I was young, success was... I got a nice car, I got a big chain, I got some money, I look, I look successful. I say this because sometimes success comes before maturity does. And there are individuals in our, in our world that reach success before maturity. Maturity is the knowledge, comprehension, and wisdom to understand how to deal with success, how people look at success. People say, oh, you acting different now. No, you just treat me a little bit different. If I jumped off the bus, you would feel comfortable because you'd be like, oh, okay, you riding a bus like me. If I jump out the Bentley, you're going to say, damn, you got a Bentley? And people begin to, begin to treat you different. If you didn't know how much a person had money-wise, you would just treat them like regular people. But then when you see somebody, you're like, if Steph Curry walked in here right now, somebody would be like, oh, man, I go Steph Curry. Because of this fictitious lifestyle that we give celebrities or that we give certain people. Then there will be somebody on the reverse spectrum of that would tell them, man, I don't care about Steph Curry. I play basketball too. Brother, why are you upset at Steph Curry? You upset at him because he played basketball? He didn't. I don't care about no Steph Curry. It's a crazy way that people treat you when you become successful. It's a crazy way that people treat you when you become happy. It's a crazy way that people treat you when you become at peace. If Maya Angelou would have died at 20 years old, we would only know her as a prostitute. We would know her as a dancer. She lived long enough for us to know her as Dr. Maya Angelou, a phenomenal woman. If Malcolm X would have died at 20 years old, we would know him as a pimp. We'd know him as a con artist. We'd know him as a gangster. we know him as a tidbit hustler. He lived long enough to become the brother Malik el Shabazz, the Messiah of the word that was able to translate many masses of words to walk the walk, to go from jive talk, slick talk, to being able to articulate in a room full of scholars and dignitaries and an educator, what I'm saying is we have to learn to stop condemning people for where they are right now. 
and give them an opportunity to grow. For who are you to judge someone for who they are right now, not knowing that that person may grow to be greater than you've ever known? And he might be able to be the greatest person that they know. There are racist individuals that have grew up in racism and that's all they knew. And when they got older, they were able to be the biggest philanthropy, philanthropists in the world that gave back to the same people that they once held high malice against. There are people that were anti this and anti that, that learned, that developed. In biblical scripture, Paul was a gangster and a killer and he ended up killing for certain people and then he translated and he went to be able to say, hold on, we doing this now. I came with a new name, new vibe. Saul, Paul, I got a new, I'm a new man. We had to give him space to do that. Some of us don't give people space to grow and we hold them in this judgmental box and we lock them in that box. People here see me doing lectures and speaking, they be like, oh man, Why you the same dude that used to ride around the streets crazy, ride around with all them gangsters and thugs, y'all doing selling drugs, y'all doing all that. Man, how you gonna tell? Listen, brother, who better to tell you than somebody that lived it? Who better to tell you than somebody that have the lived experience that have gone through the things that I'm talking about? Would you rather hear it from someone that had no connection to it or would you rather hear someone that has been in it? See, I was affected by it, but I didn't allow myself to get infected by it. It's okay to be affected. Affected just lets you know that you still have sensibility to touch, feel, hear, see. We can be affected by many things. We just have to stop ourselves before we become infected. And I'm long-winded, so I don't know how much longer because I wanted to touch on some things, affected, infected, but the beauty of having to correct it. The time of yourself, like I said earlier, when is it the time that we're gonna say, I am focused on healing? I'm no longer hiding my hurt. I'm not hiding what hurts me anymore. I'm setting boundaries. I'm allowing people to say, hold on, you're gonna have to respect my boundaries. You might say I changed, and I did. I had to. I had to change because I wanted change. My son is three years old, my daughter is 15. For the past two weeks, for the first time in his three-year-old life, we've all been together. First time, me, my daughter, and my son. I remember when I was having my son and telling my daughter was like, I was like, I was like Adam running in the garden, <laughs> like trying to hide from God. I was like, man, I ain't finna tell this girl I got a baby on the way. She finna kill me. I can't even understand how I'm finna do this. Like she she probably will disown me. And in a way, she kind of did. In a way, she, <laughs> a weird way, she was like, bro, you cheated on me, blood, and had a baby? <laughs> like, like, you got a baby? And it was like, I'm like, damn. How I'm finna tell my daughter that I got another baby on the way? Because I can only imagine for a 12-year-old what their mind is thinking. I've had you this whole time by myself. Now I got to share you? Now I got to share you to a woman who my mama don't like? So I don't like this woman anyway. My mama don't like her. Toxic things. And the reason why I'm opening up to a group of strangers that I have no idea about because I cannot no longer hide what hurts me. I wear my heart on my sleeve. My life is a textbook and you can open any chapter and read anything about me that you choose. I put it out there like that. The reason being is because no one can ever use anything that I've done and anything that has, that, that, that has happened to me in my life against me. If I give you my book of life and I tell you read every chapter that you wanna choose, ask any question that you wanna ask, I don't have to hide anything. You won't hear about tabloids coming up years later talking about some stuff that I've done. I've already told you. People will be like, oh, I read that in the book. 
my book of life has everything that I've ever done, and I'm not ashamed of it. There are some good things. There are some bad things. The main thing in the text is hopefully that the good outweighs the bad. I'm not a perfect person. I'm not a saint. I don't claim to be. I've done things. Uh, some, like I say, I've done, we've all done some things that we might take to the grave. But I'm happy where I am at, in life right now. I'm happy that I'm able to be able to say I'm growing, becoming a better father, becoming a better listener, a better friend, involved in my community, abdicating away from ideas that I thought were concrete and realizing that that was just biased perspective to where I was from. It is as if when Martin Malcolm X went to Mecca and he realized and he saw people from all walks of life praying. He said, it's Caucasian Muslims? Changed his whole perspective on life. And he came back and said, damn, a lot of stuff that I was being taught. Damn, that wasn't right. To have the temerity to believe that and the audacity to understand that some of the things that we were taught weren't right. That's where I'm at in my life right now. As I share my story, I become a walking testimony to my friends, to people that come from the walks of life that I come from, and for those who stand afar and witness, who may not never understand what it's like to have parents on drugs, who may not understand what it was like to go to the store with a note. Going to the store with a note. And look how this is intercepted. I'm going to the store with a note from my grandmother asking for some cigarettes because, you know, she couldn't live without her cigarettes. She wanted her, her Newports. That's why till this day I call every cigarette a Newport. I don't care if it's a cool or Marlboro or anything. You're smoking on Pots. That's all I, every cigarette is a Newport to us. So she wants some Newports. She wants $10 worth of chicken. She wants $5 worth of head hog, a hog head cheese, some cheese, and $2 worth of dry salami. So I'm reading this note. I'm like, okay, this note about $16, $17. Now, on my way to the store, I see my friend who's standing across the street who says, what you doing? And going to the store for grandmama real quick. I'll be back. Bro, come here, bro. Go take this to that car. So I take what he gives me, and I go to the car. And I give what he gives me to the person in the car, and the person in the car give me $100. So I go back to my friend and be like, oh, here go this honey. He give me 50. He say, it's money out here, cuz. This like this every day. So I'm looking at this 50, and I'm looking at this note, and I say, I could go pay this note off, go get my grandmama the stuff that she need, take her some change, she don't have to pay this dude back Friday, then I could come back to the corner, and I could get some more of these 50s. Ooh. Yeah, hold on, let me go to the store real quick. Let me take this to my grandmama. Many of my friends lost their innocence just walking to the store. A trip to the corner store got them indoctrinated into hustling forever. Some of them got so addicted to hustling that they didn't even realize that they were on drugs. See, we always looked at the people that was using the drugs as the dope fiends. We didn't realize that the people that was selling the drugs were dope fiends too. They both were addicted to dope and what it does to them. Some were addicted that the dope made them money. Some got addicted that the dope got them high. Identifying what it does for you is the moral of this story. And where is discipline stay in? And at what moment in your life do you feel like you have to heal from some of the things that have hurt you? It is almost impossible for one to heal in the same environments that they've been hurt. And if you do, you have an extreme amount of discipline. And in that, I commend you. No one has forced anyone to be here today. No one has told anyone that this is something that is mandatory. This is about us realizing and embracing the things that we're doing and taking it to the next level to become the best version of ourselves. If there's nothing more that I wish upon you is peace, for I understand the importance of it. Peace is far greater than any amount of profit that we can make. 
Peace is far greater than any car that you can drive. And nothing is more important than peace. To truly be at peace is to find heaven on earth. And in that heaven, may the gates open up to you and embrace you as a child of peace. My name is Stanley Cox. Most of the people call me Mr. Fab around this area. And I'm so thankful that you guys have given me your undivided attention. Thank you so much. Give this man some motherfucking love, please. And also give Dave some love for, uh, for Dave, putting it on. Dave, baby. Do you mind taking a picture with the headline? Please. Yeah, you, you know, th this wasn't our original intention, but for somebody that's not super connected to psychedelics, that that was beyond beautiful and really what our deep work is all about. So, thank you. Hell of a headliner. <laughs> Can I hug you? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was so beautiful. If there's any questions, anybody, I, I don't know if we have time for that. We have time. Anybody got anything want to ask, any stuff? So nobody don't care. Yeah, right here, the lady. <laughs> yes? Um, so you said everybody's going to be affected and the goal is not to be infected. So how do you then, if you are faced with options that keep you within the same environment, find ways to navigate ways to peace if you cannot leave? And aforementioned, I said that it's almost impossible for one to heal in the same environments that they've been hurt in. Almost still leaves room for the possibility. I watched my mom do drugs, my dad do drugs. Everybody in my family, my mom had 10 sisters, nine of them all on drugs. Some still to this day. The amount of discipline that is required for one to not only just maintain is paramount, but for one to actually go beyond the discipline and the discernment to understand that you want different in those boundaries and understanding that I'm not about to become what y'all want me to become. I'm not going to be that. I'm, I want better for myself. I want, not only do I want better for me, I want better for my friends, for my children, for whatever it is that I'm going through in life. And I'm going to realize that no matter what it takes, I'm going to get the job done. I draw so much inspiration from our ancestors and the things that they had to go through. A walking the school of the song Strange Fruit. You familiar with that song? That song was wrote by a Jewish guy in the 30s. Gave it to Billie Holiday. Billie Holiday made it hit record. When Nina Simone sang that song, I felt so connected to it because here it is when you imagine a young girl walking to school, seeing this strange fruit swaying on the trees. That strange fruit to many who may not know are black people being hung from trees and her still having to go to school them having to still endure the things that they had to endure in the midst of all that the world was giving them. Segregation, racism, hatred, murder, rape, death, and them still getting to where they wanted to go. In the words of Tupac, against all odds, for everybody that doesn't believe, long as I make that commitment to myself, and that dedication that I am going to be something different and I'm going to do something different, that's the how to me. That's the how. Because if they gave a final synopsis of what I would be, if I allowed them to take my story and write it, mine would probably either be dead by now or in jail. But when writing my story, I'm keeping a pen in my hand and I'm gonna do everything. I'm gonna change the whole narrative, discipline and dedication. And I hope that means something and resonates with you. 
Thank you for your question. Any other questions? Got one right here. Uh, yeah, peace, King. Right over here, man. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. You know you're the reason why I did the Steph Curry reference. I right? know. I, I, okay. I got that. I gave you that idea? Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. All right. I got you. Yeah, man. Um, so, man, thank you so much for being here and sharing what you like having the courage to just come out here doing what you're doing, man. I definitely got to make it on a Wednesday. Um, and I can tell like you're a person that's been through a lot of crossroads in life, you know, and it's so, like when we talk about protecting our peace, what goes to war with our peace? Oftentimes it's each other relationships with women, our partners. So in terms of brotherhood, in terms of like family, when you use those words, and you know you go, you're actually showing up in the community with that. Um, what could you say about how you've gone through life, reaching these crossroads where you could have gone left, you could have gone right? How would you say you handled those things, or like what could you say about yourself when you reach those, like when you've, that's gotten you through those moments to be who you are? Not being afraid to make mistakes. Some of us strive to be so perfect that we actually don't get a full live out this life. You gotta get a full live out this life. When it's all said and done and you return to your higher belief, you wanna go empty handed. You wanna be able to say, man, I, everything you gave me, I gave it back. I gave it back, I gave it back in droves. I made mistakes, I laughed, I cried, I fell, I flew, I danced. I jogged, I ran, I slept, I ate. You got to get some live out of this life. You know, there's a thin line between procrastinator and perfectionist. A perfectionist tries their whole life to get it right. They're waiting for this perfect moment. Let me tell you something. None of us know how much time that we've been rewarded. There's no perfect time other than now to do whatever it is that you want to do in life and live with the results. For every loss, there's a lesson. Knowledge without application is just information. So when reading that lesson, being able to apply that to the next saga in life. But if you don't do anything, get some live out this life and it'll begin to start figuring itself out. Michelle. Any more? You have one? My man. This thing on? Okay, okay. Uh, so, first of all, just thank you for saying what you're saying and being who you are, first of all, uh, because I'm, I'm from Oakland too, and um, I look up to the example. So I guess the question is going through life in all the different phases. Uh, what, what at this point, what is your self actualization? Like what is that, what is that pinnacle of self discovery for you? And what would you want to leave behind? I'm just a vessel. I am only doing the work that I was sent here to do, this framework. And sometimes we run away from our mission. My mother used to always say, you know you're gonna be a preacher. And I'm like, man, I ain't gonna be no preacher. I ain't gonna be no preacher. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be a pimp. Just be honest, in transparency, this is just me being a young kid. I'm gonna be a pimp. I ain't gonna be no preacher. But I didn't understand what form of preaching she was talking about. You were going to be somebody that spread the word to people in the masses and be able to be an example that someone can say, blood did it, I could do it, and I'm going to preach a word. Jonah ran away from where he was supposed to go, right? I don't know if you're familiar with the Bible. In the Bible, I'm going to give it to you in hood terms. So it was this dude, right? He's from East Oakland, right? And God told him, bro, you got to go to Richmond. And he was like, bro, I ain't going to Richmond, bro. That nigga's crazy in Richmond. 
So when he was like, bro, I ain't finna. What part of Richmond? He's like, North Richmond. He's like, North Richmond, bro, I ain't going there, bro. God, you tripping, blood. So God was like, nah, nah, bro, I really need you to go to Richmond. So you like, mm-mm. So it was some folks that was going to Hayward. You ain't know them, but they had a truck. You hopped on the truck. You hopped on the truck. When you hopped on the truck, the truck caught a flat. The driver was like, man, there's somebody on this thing, on this truck that ain't supposed to be on here. Who on this thing? And they look. He like, blood, where you from, blood? So they didn't know you, so they kicked you off the truck. When you got kicked off the truck, they threw you in the Dumbarton Bridge. You got threw in the Dumbarton Bridge, big ass whale came and swallowed you up. You like, oh, blood, I'm about to die, blood. That's crazy, blood. But you wonder how you still alive and you can still hear yourself talking to yourself in this whale mouth. You like, but how long I'm finna be in this whale mouth? Whale dry you around for like two days, right? Whale finally open up. You like, oh, you come out the whale mouth like, oh, bruh, I'm still alive, bruh. It's lit. You wiping stuff off, then you ask somebody, hey, bro, where I'm at? He like, bro, you in North Richmond. Like, what? Oh, blood. You damn near want to go back in the whale mouth. But then I said all that to say, that was the story of Jonah in the Bible. He was supposed to go, he was summoned to the shores of Nineveh, and he ran away from his calling. But in life, you will be where you're supposed to be when you step up and you adhere to your calling. And that's all I'm doing. I'm adhering to what my mama and what my grandmama said. May not be the traditional form of pastor and preacher, but it's about showing these folks in the areas that we at. You don't got to be Mr. Goody Two Shoes. You don't got to know the Bible like the back of your hand, but doing good. And still being able to make mistakes, still being able to say, I ain't perfect. I might be at church on Sunday, but I might be at the strip club on Saturday. And I'm okay with that. I ain't perfect. But that example, many of us have gotten discouraged by churches and by super major things because we've seen stuff like, oh man, love you acting like he better than us. Nah, I'm standing right side by you. And that's the example. That's who I am. And as I continue to grow, that's what I wanna leave behind. That it's okay. It's okay to make mistakes. It's okay not to be perfect. It's okay to grow. It's okay to learn. It's okay to teach. It's okay to humble yourself. I'm just happy to be here. For sure. About it. You are a preacher. You know, you, yeah. <laughs> I didn't expect to be one either, but, you know, I mean, everything that you've been saying is just so on point for all the work we do and all the stuff that we're talking about. I mean, it's your proof that you don't need psychedelics to do it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and there are many different ways to reach these places, but just where you've gotten just by going through and being who you are, it's, it's, it's so beautiful. And, you know, they, it, it was a little busier earlier, but you fit in completely. I mean, it was by far, if we had actually thought it through, you were who we should, we're, we were meant to have here, Man. right? Oh, 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 appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, just like you're talking, neither of us knew that this is, this is what was happening tonight, right? right? Last week, no idea, right. you know, and, but the whale swallowed up uh, Robin Carhart <laughs> Harris and, you know, uh, sure. it, it, uh, my amazing assistant Karina ran into Unk as he was walking out of the store and we could have never predicted it, but you're amazing. Thank and you, brother. Uh, I, I'm sure everybody in here resonates with everything you're saying. I mean, you you are a preacher, like it or not. You know, give them one more Thank real so big much. round of applause.